Hi, everyone. So we're going to kick off day three here for our first technical, se technical session of the day. Uh, my name is Christopher Sege. I'm a working group member, and I'll be uh, facilitating this session. And just a reminder, there is a uh, surveys at each of your tables. So if you don't mind, at the end of the session, just fill the survey and just leave it at the table and someone will come around and pick it up. Also, at the end of the session, uh, come see me or another working group member and we'll do your passport to prizes, give you your whole punch for, for attending this session. Also, at, uh, if there's any questions, I'll be walking around with a mic. Our, our, our instructor for today, he's uh, joining us virtually. So it'll be imperative that uh, we speak in the mic for, so we could hear him, or he could hear us too. Also, so our, instru our, our instructor is Henry. Henry is a wet instructor, and he is certified to teach all available wet courses. He serves on the CSA and ULC committees for venting and solid fuel appliances. He has spent his career with the family chimney business and is in the early 1990s conducted seminars on venting, house pressures, and code. While teaching wet courses in Inuvik, Northwest Territories, Henry recognized the need for hands-on training together with the classroom teaching. He has been involved with his uh, teaching model for just over a decade in Northwest Territories, Labrador, and Northern Ontario. Henry has also conducted multiple presentations and has been a keynote speaker on occasion to speak on topics of wood, wood heat safety and efficient use. So yeah, please welcome Henry virtually. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you to all of you for having me as a speaker. I do apologize for not being with you in person in Thunder Bay. I have not figured out how to be present in two locations at once, except maybe this works by meeting virtually. As I speak to you this morning, I am just returned back home from Winnipeg from the Northwest Territories on a stove changeout pro project. To start my presentation, I'll start by reciting, not singing, this song written by Armstrong and Gollum titled The Firewood Song. And it's sung to the tune of the eyes and by that builds the boats. I'm the guy that cuts the logs and I'm the guy that splits them. I stack the wood in nice straight rows and wait six months to burn them. The sun, she warms my firewood pile and dries out all the water. The wind blows through there all the while and carries away the moisture. Bless the sun and bless the wind. They make my wood much drier. If they didn't have time to do their job, the pile would be much higher. My chimney don't fill up with soot. My pipes don't drip black water. I'm better off to burn dry wood. Keeps me warm all through the winter. I'm the guy that cuts the logs and I'm the guy that splits them. It costs me nothing to get them dry. The sun and winds assist them. There is a lot of truth to that song. In a previous time as your speaker, I gave a history of how the hands-on training came about regarding installing wood stove systems in certain First Nation communities. And I will not now repeat that message, but I have a new message. If ever you are interested in hearing how the program for the First Nation communities works, I could interact with you after this conference. In parts of the country, we do conduct, conduct these courses slightly different, region by region, but the base content is the same. Today, I will speak about safety concerns regarding how the end user needs to be educated and operating these appliances correctly and safely, and the role for community leaders. Harvesting and burning wood is a lifestyle and a very healthy one at that. As the song I just quoted so well said it. You could say that harvesting and burning with wood connects you with creation and your environment around you. We are accountable to what we do to creation by the creator. The one who created this world and us 
is very involved in the creation at every moment or we would not be here or exist. But we sure do our darndest to wreck it. It takes effort to collect and harvest the fuel we burn in our stoves. And it takes knowledge to know how to burn these stoves correctly. To store the fuel. Safe burning practices. Ensuring safe clearances are kept. Working carbon monoxide and smoke alarms are installed and being used. Safe storage of fuel in the home. And how far combustibles need to be away from the stove. This is not exhaustive by any means of our imagination, but community leaders need knowledge as well in knowing what wood stove is the correct type and size for a particular home. One size does not fit all homes and bigger the stove definitely does not make it a better stove for just any application. What type of venting system to purchase for a particular home? The house is a system and how the layout of the home, the role of the exhaust, whether fans, furnaces, HRVs, etc., could affect the appliance, the role of wind, and what we call stack effect. So let's start with proper fuel. In the advanced combustion stoves, Either they are catalytic or non-catalytic, and they'll be certified to CSA B415, Canadian Emission Standards, and or EPA certified. These appliances require proper fuel and burning practices. The song I just quoted from earlier correctly said this in part of one of the verses. My chimney don't fill up with soot. My pipes don't drip black water. I'm better off to burn dry wood, keeps me warm all through the winter. The song tells a story. The individual who harvested and stacked the fuel correctly is kept warm in the winter. And their chimney doesn't fill up with soot and creosote. And the flue pipe doesn't drip black water because they are burning seasoned dry wood. Here you got pictures. The black water is the one on the far left. It's liquid creosote that's dripped out of the flue pipe onto the floor. You can see when the chimney was removed, the ceiling bucket support has the liquid creosote in it. And you can see the buildup within the chimney itself on the far right. So how do we get to the point of having good, clean burning practices? Well, let's start with fuel. Let me ask you a question. What was the means of transportation before the automobile? And I'm not talking about just walking. Most of you will say the vehicle would have been a cart or a wagon pulled by oxen or horses or riding a horse on its back, maybe a dog team. Does the horse or the ox need fuel to carry the load in the cart, wagon, or on its back? Of course it does. So what was the fuel? Today I'm sure you have all traveled by some sort of transportation that was not a horse or an ox pulled cart. Did that view vehicle require fuel? Of course it did. If you drove a vehicle or had a ride in a vehicle powered by an internal gas combustion engine, was that vehicle powered by grass or hay? Would you even consider filling the gas tank with hay? If you did, how well would that vehicle work? So why do we do it with our advanced combustion stoves? I have walked into communities across Canada 
And I see the same practices from coast to coast to coast and everywhere in between. Now, I'm not lumping everyone into conducting very poor wood burning practices, but the major overwhelming majority are. For a moment, remember your community. Take yourself to your community in your mind. You're going for a walk. And as you walk in the community, you look at the chimneys. Now you're walking through the community. It is winter time. You stop. You see your own house and chimney. What do you see? What is coming out of the chimney stack? Is it smoke? Now, the question must be asked, why? Is it because the house is being heated with an older, inefficient wood stove? It could be. I would expect smoke from an older, conventional stove. Now, what if the answer to the question is that a new, advanced combustion stove was recently installed? Why is that creating smoke? Fuel would be where I would look at first. Unseasoned firewood. Woodheat.org has this to say about firewood. With a little practice, you can judge the moisture content of firewood accurately enough to tell green from seasoned. You don't really need to buy a wood moisture meter. I have one that I rarely use, and then only to confirm what I already know. I'm expected to test wood moisture because people see me as a professional wood burner. There are a few ways to tell if wood is dry enough to burn efficiently. Use as many indicators as possible to judge the dryness of the firewood you are considering. Here is five ways to judge firewood moisture presented in order of the most to least effective. Check for cracks in the end grain. This is a seasoned piece of firewood to check for dryness, but may not be a reliable indicator. Some wet wood has checks and some wood has no checks. Here's wet wood. The wood tends to darken from white or cream color to gray or yellow as it dries. There's the wet wood and there's the dry wood. Two dry pieces bang together. Make sound hollow. Two wet pieces are dull. Dry wood weighs much less than wet wood. Split a piece of wood. If the exposed surface feels damp, the wood is too wet to burn. If in doubt, burn some. Dry wood ignites and burns easily. Wet wood is hard to light and hisses in the fire. Good wood for burning should be, should be between 15 to 20%. Freshly cut wood will have a about 50% moisture content. A live tree does have 50%. Here's your dry wood. Here's a moisture meter. And here I got 12.5%. I take my wet wood and I'm at 46%. When I see a truck or truck and trailer drive down the highway at this time of the year, with freshly cut wood in it, I cringe. I am pretty sure that the home that that firewood is going to will be creating smoke, 
pollution, and it will be seen leaving the chimney. I also must make a comment on standing dead wood or burned standing wood post forest fire. That too is not seasoned wood. Ask yourself this question. Is there moisture in the ground? Are the roots of the tree in contact with the moisture? That root to the dead tree acts as a sponge and moisture is absorbed into the middle of the tree. That standing dead tree might be a little better than a fresh cut live tree, but it still contains moisture in the middle of that tree. And the first phase of your fire is the evaporation of moisture in your fuel and you will have more moisture to evaporate. The standing deadfall still requires to be cut, split, and stacked to allow the sun and wind to do its job in removing the high moisture content and permit that the fuel be burned in an environmentally good and safe way. This is good for the homeowner, the community, and the environment. So continue on your walk in your community. And as you walk, looking at the chimneys, you notice something missing. First on this house, then that house. Around 50% of the houses have something missing. And you stop and you ask yourself, Is this okay? We've always done this. It must be fine. It is a factory built chimney with no rain cap. So is there a rain cap on the top of the chimney? With no rain cap, the insulation of the chimney will be getting moisture in it from the rain. With wet insulation, that will cool the gases off, creating soot, or worse yet, creosote. Wet insulation in a factory-built chimney will have a poor draft, hence the possibility of smoke entering the house when the door is open. Smoke smell in the house, house in the home, is an unhealthy pollutant. Now that same chimney will be producing soot and creosote, and that is fuel. And in the right condition, we now have a chimney fire. But with wet insulation, the chimney cannot perform as it was designed to and maybe not protect the, the chimney fire from becoming a house fire. The main cause for the rain cap to, re to be removed is because the fuel the firewood's moisture content is too high and the rain cap plugs up. Smoke enters the dwelling. Remove the rain cap and it appears to be cured. Remember what I said earlier about our responsibility to creation and the creator? Removing the rain cap is solving a symptom, not the sickness. Another reason given for removal of the rain cap is wind, but in windy conditions, the rain cap actually enhances the draft to the, so the diagnosed is wrong and incorrect. Now let us say that the community, maybe through another organization or governments have done some homework and purchased well-produced and designed advanced combustion wood stoves. Those living in the home are very happy with their new wood stove, chimney, flue pipe, and hearth pad that has just been installed. It could be said that it is like a beautiful park, brand new Cadillac is there. A phrase used when I was younger, kind of saying this proves my age. How is this appliance going to be fed, operated, and with what fuel? Remember what I said about our responsibility towards creation is. It seems everything is done well. We all can pat ourselves on the back and go home. But not so quickly. Research is being done on wood-burning appliances and their effect on the environment. 
HPBAC just released their semi-annual industry report this month, October 2023. And this is a summary of a study done by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Environ Environment and Climate Change Canada released a study on emissions from wood burning in late July. Emissions testing was conducted on a variety of certified and non-certified wood stoves to explore how different factors affect emission levels. Researchers found that the variables examined during emissions testing, was draft, moisture content of wood, and fuel type, could not fully explain emissions levels, as statistical models suggested that other factors besides those studied were influencing results. While moisture content of the fuel was the only variable found to have statistically significant influence on emissions, results did show a clear improvement in emissions between non-certified stoves and EPA's 2020 certified stoves. A summary finding in this study stated this, moisture content was the only variable of interest that was found to have statistically a significant impact on emissions levels, end of quote. So if we are concerned with the environment and health of those in the community, more needs to be done than just researching the best appliance for a certain application, but also education is needed for the communities and the end user. For some at this point, it might seem the easy answer is just let's ban woodworking, wood burning, and find infrastructure that will permit electricity only. This is unrealistic. And I'm sure that studies are further, when they are further done into the effects of electri electricity, we will have concerns then about the heavy use of electricity. Wood burning, when done correctly, is a safe method to burn in the homes, keeping our homes warm and is very good for the environment. When done correctly, it is true environmentally favorable method of providing much needed heat and a true renewable resource. We should never run out of fuel in Canada. Just recently, I was in a First Nation community and as I was walking to the training room, for another day of training, school, you could call it. I walked by a new fourplex being built. I looked up and I saw. In this picture, I see a chimney far below its required height. The manufacturer's installation instruction states this. Authorities will require that the chimney extend not less than three feet above the highest point where it passes through the roof of a building and not less than two feet above any portion of the building within 10 feet. See figure one. See chart two for chimney height above the roof on page 21 of these instructions. This truly is less than the required three foot extended above the roof and the two feet above any portion of the building within 10 feet. But something else caught my eye on that walk that morning, and it was the flashing. That is a rubber boot flashing on a metal roof. But that is not made by the chimney manufacturer or tested with that chimney. The installation instructions for that chimney state, use only Selkirk's model JSC SPR JFC listed components, JSC SPR JFC are models of chimney that Selkirk does make. This rubber boot flashing is of great concern and the concern comes about if and when a chimney fire does happen. Manufacturers flashings serve two purposes. First, to shed water and the rubber boot flashing will do this adequately. Second is to dissipate heat. The manufacturer's flashings are larger than the chimney's exterior sh shell and are designed to have ventilation around the chimney. 
Even the certified rubber boot flashing, which the chimney manufacturer provides as disallowance. The current flashing does not. And under a severe condition like a chimney fire, the heat would be trapped and could potentially overheat the framing members of the house around the chimney and the chimney fire would become a house fire. What was so concerning about this chimney is that it was installed by a contractor and the installer was certified for installing solid fuel burning appliances and their components. Here is another example of an installation of a factory built chimney running up the exterior of a building with an offset in the chimney, yet there is no proper support for the elbows. And I've seen similar installations to this design in a few communi communities. A wall support should have been installed above the elder elbows. So this now goes to the community leaders and those in housing. The easy answer appears, hire a contractor who they and their employees are certified for this kind of work. Careful research needs to be done as these pictures show, to find good and competent technicians. There is much for those who are involved in the planning, design, and ordering of wood stoves and its venting components. Here is a short list of what to look for. A wood stove used in Canada is required to be certified to ULC S627. To be good for the environment and the health of the community members, a stove certified to EPA standards 2020 and or certified to CSA B415. These appliances operate differently than the old wood stoves. But if our forefathers knew how to burn the old stoves with mixed fuel, so we can learn as well being their offspring. The stove should be sized correctly for where it will be installed and attention to location of the appliance needs to be heated as well. The hearth pad needs to be of the correct material, continuous, durable, and non-combustible. It may require an R factor and that needs to be considered. Also the size needs to be of correct size and have the proper extensions on all sides of the stove. The flue pipe, if certified, required, is required in Canada to be certified to ULC S641. Factory built chimneys are required to be certified to ULC S629 if used for venting flue gases from a wood stove in Canada. Only certified parts tested for that chimney may be used. Attention needs to be given to the requirements of extra shielding that may be required to be used on a given application. Heat shields, whether installed on the walls or a ceiling, require to be certified to ULC S632. Also, a heat shield site made may be used in Canada if it follows all the prescriptive requirements of the CSA B365, an installation code for solid fuel appliance, burning appliances and equipment. CSA B365 is very descriptive on how that shield will be installed as well as the size and minimum type of material. And sadly, the vast majority of wall shields installed in First Nation homes are not built to these requirements. And to me, they become a glorified magnet holders only. And this comes to requirement for maintenance. The National Fire Code of Canada is to be followed. And it is law in Canada. If all followed this code as it is written, we would see no chimney fires or maybe very, very few. Here are some clauses that pertain to us. Clause 2.6.1.4. Every chimney, flue, and flue pipe shall be inspected to identify any dangerous condition. A, at intervals not greater than 12 months. B, at the time of addition of any appliance. C, after any chimney fire. Chimneys, flues, and flue pipes shall be cleaned as often 
as necessary to keep them free from dangerous accumulation of combustible deposits. A chimney flue and flue pipe shall be replaced or repaired to <clears throat> D, eliminate any structural deficiency or decay, and E, all abandoned or unused openings that are not effectively sealed in a manner that would prevent the passage of fire or smoke. Appendix A for 2.6.1.4 sentence 2 says, the presence in the chimney of a deposit of soot or creosote in excess of three millimeters thick, that's the width of a dime, will have the need for immediate cleaning, possible modification of burning procedures, and more frequent inspections. National Fire Code Clause 2.6.1.5 Required clearances between chimneys, flue pipes, or appliances and combustible construction shall be maintained in confirmation with the National Building Code of Canada. Combustible materials shall not be located within the required clearance space surrounding chimneys, flue pipes, or appliances or adjacent to ash pits or clean outdoors. End of quote. So in many cases, the chimney sweep ought to be sweeping these chimneys once a week due to the soot and creosote buildup. If we desire to sweep and clean these chimneys less, less often, we need to have everyone instructed in and buying in to good burning practices with proper fuel being used. Never mind all the good we will be doing for the environment. Basically, the byproducts of an advanced combustion stove burning correctly is carbon dioxide. And you all know what needs carbon dioxide is nourishment to grow and produce oxygen. Something we need as well. And, and that to warm our fire in our homes. The trees need the carbon dioxide. So take that walk when the education has been successfully taught and is in practice. Walk in your community. Stop. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Smell nature and notice the smoke smell is not there. Open your eyes. Look at those chimneys. They are clean. All have rain caps. No smoke coming from the chimneys. Realize you are in nature. The creator is there as well. Enjoy it. Embrace that peace. Walk in that peace. I thank you for having me here this morning. And there should be a time, I guess, for... A Q and A. Any questions? Any questions for Henry this morning? One over here. I was just wondering if uh, we could get what we've seen today out in print form, printed out for us. Like, sorry, what he could get. What he saw what he printed saw. out? Sure. Thank you. I didn't take notes. Yeah, usually uh, all the conference materials, like the, these presentations, they're online. Just go to the NFHC website, wherever you registered, and it, sh it should be on there shortly after the conference. Give it, a, give it a week or so. It should be there. All right. But if Chris, if he wants it, he can just uh, email me, and I, I can send it. Okay, that works too. Hello, um, my name is Vicki Reed and I work for Sulaco First Nations Health Authority. Um, I just wanted to um, compliment your delivery of this um, presentation. Um, as an author and writer, uh, your storytelling conveyed uh, more so than any type of presentation on data and whatnot. Um, it was very engaging and I uh, just wanted to say miigwech. Thank you. Any more questions for Henry or comments from the crowd? Oh. I just needed the email. 
Oh, yeah, the, uh, Henry's email address is on the screen. So maybe be put a little bit bigger. Oh, question in the front. It's real easy. It's my initials at mts.net. Hi. Um, I noticed in your presentation you, you did not address carbon monoxide. I uh, did not. That would be <laughs> another presentation. Are you able to quickly just talk about it and the inefficiency of a wood stove and how it can create carbon monoxide? Just a quick blurb. Yeah, so a lot of it's going to be on the design of the uh, of your venting system. Um, if you let's say you had your uh, wood stove in the basement and you run your chimney up the exterior of the wall through the basement wall and up the exterior wall. Uh, as you get to the end of your fire cycle, now the flu the temperature of your fire is going to be very low. That's where we could get an impingement of the flame, and it uh, it can create um, carbon monoxide. Naturally, cold air is wanting to come down in the home. You got positive air uh, area of the home, and you got a negative. Hot air rises, cold air falls down, and if you exit in the negative zone of the house with your chimney you're susceptible to getting that carbon monoxide. Most of your home designs are good designs. They go straight up. So the, your chance of getting carbon monoxide would be a, 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 some sort of too much air leaving the home, which an HRV could cause that problem. A plugged HRV, unbalanced. Thank you, Henry. Any more questions for anyone? Uh, not seeing any. Uh, well, once again, Henry, thanks for the presentation, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. And just a reminder for all all the uh, participants: uh, fill out the survey at each of your table, and uh, just leave it there. Someone will pick it up and uh, come see me to punch your passport to prizes. And uh, enjoy the conference, and see you later, Henry. <laughs> I wish I was there in person. I hope next year to be there in person. For sure. Take care. Okay. Thanks.